So Mark, uh, welcome to the Train Effective uh, Academy. And I want to definitely uh, have you give you the, 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 the mic here and introduce yourself and tell these, uh, uh, all these players about yourself and what you're going to talk to us to, today. Okay. How you doing, guys? Hope you're good. Uh, my name's Mark Beard. Um, originally from London, obviously England, um, and I had, uh, had a, I've had a really successful career, really. So uh, what I'm going to go through today with you is my junior career, sort of like the ages you're at now, into my youth career as a professional. Um, in England, they call it a scholarship. It's probably like you going to college or university and then into the professional game. And then I'm going to talk about the other side of it, about how I did that, first of all, and then the other side of it as well. After um, my, I finished playing, then what now as a coach? I've been a coach at Brighton for seven years um in the premier league in england um and i'll talk about that and what we look for in england and not just in england across the world really in in players and what how how we could probably help you uh, benefit to make yourself the best you could be so i'll go through my playing career coaching career and then there'll be questions at the end if that's okay yeah um first of all al have you got the video of my goal so one of the most famous things um, uh, people recognise me for in England is when I was playing for Millwall, I was only 20 years old, I got um, picked for the FA Cup game against Arsenal. Now, Arsenal at the time, Arsenal were a good team, obviously, now, but then they was the Invincibles, they was unbelievable. They didn't concede any goals, they was, like, top of the league, and I was playing for Millwall, and we drew the first game nil-nil at the den. We had an FA Cup replay at Highbury in front of 38,000 um, and I ended up scoring the first goal. So at 20 years old, it's what I, I could still go to Mill now, 25 years later, whatever it is, and fans still buy me drinks and remember me in a photo. So for me, just that one moment in my football career, people still remember it. And it's still shown on FA Cup Classics on BT wow. Sport, which is a big show here. So um, that many years later, not many games are shown like that. So if you could put it up, Al, please, so the boys yes, can watch yes. it. <laughs> Okay, can you guys see the screen? Yeah, you can see it, yeah. The highlight of 1995 was an outstanding run in the FA Cup. It began with an epic third round win at Highbury, a sweet victory that earned the Lions revenge for a controversial cup defeat against the Gunners 12 months earlier. There's Van Blair. Just hit it in. They score. Mark Beard arrives in the back post, and where it was, Arsenal's defence. Eleven minutes gone, and the team from Division One opened the scoring at Highbury. Arsenal's goal continues. Jason Van Gogh coming up from left back. He skipped into acres of space with Lillegan hopelessly out of position. And what a simple tapping. Miles was the edge goal in the other minutes, increasingly looking as though they'll put no more into the third round and inflict another defeat of Arsenal. Kennedy. It's all over now. Mark Kennedy with a sensational strike. Millwall's place in round four and a home tie against Chelsea is now confirmed and it was always a danger with that increasing commitment to attack in the search for the equaliser but they leave themselves vulnerable and what a shot to beat David Seaman Wow <clears throat> Thank you So guys, for me, that um, I was 20 years old. I played 20 games. Um, we had 6,000 Millwall fans at that game. So it's an away game. So I know in America, it's a massive place and uh, it's harder for the fans to travel. But in England, it's a smaller country. But we had six, six and a half, seven thousand 7,000 fans travel over. So that was a massive game for us. And for me, it's being a, such a young kid. And what I haven't said to you, I was, I was actually a Millwall fan as well. All my family's brought up in the area. So I had loads of fans there. So it's probably wherever you live in America, like then going to play for your local team and then going to score a winning goal in a massive cup game. So for me, like um, it really made my life because all 
you train your whole life as a kid you you when you're growing up you put you you dream about these moments and for me to do that at 20 years old it was a great achievement such early in my career so I want to talk about first of all is I mean I can see a lot of you um range from the ages obviously 14 15 and up and up to, to 20 so for me when I was um about 12 13 um, I kept getting told I was too small so what I always had though was that an aggression and that desire and that um, to want to be the best so every time I got knockbacks and told I'm too small I'm not this I'm not that I'm not as physical as this guy I always tried to prove them wrong so how I would do that um, one my uncle's a boxing trainer used to go boxing a couple of times a week so I'm not telling you to go do boxing but do something else make us to get yourself to be the best you could be um, think of things outside of the box how are you going to get better so you need to be quicker you need to work on your pace go to an athletic track if you need to be a little bit stronger um, do uh, do some physical stuff, not weights or anything like that, but dynamic stuff like press ups and pull ups. Do stuff that can really help you. Follow. There's loads of good tuition on online, so you can find lots of stuff. Um, and then, but the most important thing is, I was getting up. I used to go to school nine o'clock, um, so I used to wake up wake up at six o'clock in the morning, and I'd make sure I was training when no one else was. I've heard Mike Tyson say at the box, I used to get up at four o'clock. Well, I used to get up at six. I used to do a half hour run. I then used to come home, have for breakfast. I used to go to school all day thinking about being a footballer and um, how I'm going to get better. After school, obviously, go football practice. Um, so all the time I was there and I was being told I'm not going to be big enough, I'm not going to do this. I, in my head, I knew I was going to be. And you've probably been at school. We have to write what you're going to do when you finish your career, uh, when you finish school. Um, I remember once in English doing this big um, like uh, essay reading it out in front of class and people laughing. And again, that use them things where people knock you down to prove them wrong. So it got to the age where I was 16 and I signed a scholarship with Mill. Um, as I say, it's my club. I live local. Um, my first year, I didn't play a lot because I don't know if you know, in England, it it's works for two years. So 17s and 18s played together. My first year, I didn't really play a lot until after Christmas. So one, I had to be patient. Two, I had to show re resilience that if I'm not playing, how am I going to play? Am I going to sulk and uh, be a baby or am I going to get on with it and, again, prove people wrong, which I did. Um, and then I got into the team, worked my way into the team in my second year. Because of my leadership skills off of the pitch, I wasn't allowed this. I was quite quiet, but I led by example. I was made captain, which everyone was surprised about because I wasn't the best player and I openly admit that. But um, I got given the captaincy because of my hard work and uh, just silly little things. You know, when the coaches finish and you finish a session, you obviously shake hands and walk off. I would go ask the coaches that need help. I'd pick up cones. I'd do that. It may look busy, but listen, at the end of the day, the busy ones are the ones who will get far in life. Don't don't list. Don't worry about what anything anyone else says to you. You just worry about yourself and where you're going, because it's not about um, you just got to do what's right for you. OK, so little things like I did and I got my captain. That year, as a scholar, we had the best year. We was in the league with Arsenal, Tottenham, um, teams like that, Chelsea, and we come second in the league. We lost the last game of the season to Tottenham. Sol Campbell, who become an England legend, scored a hat trick against us, and we lost. We got to an FA Cup Youth FA Youth Cup final. We beat Manchester United two one at Old Trafford with David Beckham, with Paul Scholes, with Nicky Butt, with Gary Neville. And no one give us a chance to beat them. We beat them 2-1. But again, not because we was a better team, but because we wanted it. And as a group of guys, if you've got 11 men who are all, or 11 kids really, who are willing to go the extra mile for each other, um, and we got the result and we won. And um, like you see Morocco in this World Cup, not the best team by a million miles. And no one thought they'd get the group stages, but look how well they've done. Fantastic. And could have ended up getting to a final, but they just fell short. So just showing that little bit of desire, a little bit of hunger. Um, and then because of I've done so well with the youth team, I got rewarded with a first team um, pro contract. And in that pro contract, again, wasn't the best player. Um, but within three months, so I signed pro in August. By October, I was making my first team debut at 18 years of age, which in England is a very hard thing to do. Um, and so I made the debut and was a never present for the next two, three years. So, so all I can say to you guys is that you will get knockbacks. You will get um, times where you're not playing well. Confidence is a massive thing in football. And, um, but that hard work and desire and realisation that if you do get knockbacks, if you don't play well, 
Um, there's only one way to get yourself out of that, and that is by working hard. Okay. So um, have you got my CV there, Al? I can just get up quickly on the presentation. Let me just click up the presentation. Yeah. So if you go down, there's my playing career. So I had 52 appearances for Millwall. Um, and then completely out of the blue, I got a transfer for £150,000 to Sheffield United. I was 20 years old. And Sheffield United at the time was a Premier League team. Uh, so it was a massive move for me. I went up there for three years. Again, play, got to Wembley once, which is a great achievement. Got to an FA Cup semi-final um, and played really uh, over 56 games in three years. Um, then I went down the ladder a little bit. So I've gone from Championship to Premier League to Championship down to League One, then League Two. Now, all the time this was happening, I still kept my same standards, my same morals, whether I was playing Premier League or League One, League Two. I always was the captain of each team and, and kept, kept them right standards. I then uh, played in Kingstonian, which is a team um, in non-league. Went to Spain to play for two years. Um, and then I come back from Spain when I was 32 to play for a team called Stevenage. I was actually lucky enough to play at the new, when they built Wembley again, um, in front of 67,000. You can see the picture of me lifting the cup up at Wembley. So I was the first person to lift the cup up at Wembley, which was a great achievement. And that was my last professional game ever as well at Wembley. So it was a good one to bow out on. So if you didn't go to my coaching career, I'll back onto the page one. Down further, is it? Sorry. So the tough thing is, once you finish everyone's career, the hardest thing in football is it's a short career. So I'm looking at you now and you've got, you've got 15, 16 year olds in there. Um, I got told when I was 16, make the most of it because it's such a short career. But when you're 16, you think you've got your whole life ahead of you, which you have really, but um, you do not believe how quick it, it, it goes. And um, I enjoyed it, obviously. Since I left school, that's what I've done. Every single day since I left school, I'm 48 now. I've gone into a football club every single day. I've never had to work in an office. I've never had to work on a building site. Um, I've just been lucky enough to do something I love. Um, but again, that goes back to the stuff I said at the start about the hard work. It's not coincidence or luck. It's just purely through hard work. Yes, you get luck at times. Maybe you're getting spotted by a scout, getting playing in a really good, playing really well in a game and scoring a hat-trick or something, and then the scout's there. You do need luck like that. But to have longevity in football is, um, is perseverance and hard work. That's the key ingredient to it. So you can see now I've literally done all my qualifications. I'm, the only one I haven't done is pro licence. I won't need that until if I get a Premier League manager's job. So until then, I've got, I'm fully qualified. So um, most of my football qualifications are and the best things is just experience, which you learn as you go along. Can you go down a bit further, please? Has he got the presentation of the under 18s? If you go down further. There we go. So if you go back to the slide, mate. So when I worked at Brighton, um, we just got in the Premier League, the first team. These are the values. So you see uh, what I was talking about a minute ago, like my values, myself, this is the team values. My values would be hard work, attitude, desire, resilience and dedication. What we had at Brighton, we come up, not just the manager of the first team, literally from the top to the bottom of the club. These are our values. And it'd be the same with you, with Train Effective and within your clubs and within your colleges, within your schools. Uh, we decided to treat people well, um, take care to be helpful, encourage and considerate. It says customers there, but for you, it's colleagues and your teammates. If someone's having a bad time on a pitch or off the pitch, is treating them well, not putting them down even further. How do you pick them up? How are you going to be a leader? That's one of the key values that um, has come, has done really well for us when we was at Brighton. Exceed expectations. Now, when you're in the Premier League, do you all watch the Premier League at home? You don't have to say yes, but just nod. Is is the hardest league in the world. There's so many world-class players. So bright, little old Brighton are always up against it. So you've got to exceed expectations because if you go out there thinking, oh, I'm playing Chelsea today or Man United or Man City, you're going to lose. Before the game's even started, you're going to lose. So you need to, one, as a coach, get into the players' heads to think, we're going to win this game. We're going to have a game plan that we're going to go out and we're going to initiate that game plan and we're going to go win this game. Um, so as a coach, that's what you have to do to the players and we have to get them ready. The next one, aim high. 
biggest thing, never give up. The amount of times my teams at Brighton won in the 91st, 92nd, 93rd minute. I loved um, LA when they won the, when Gareth Bale scored the header. And I weren't just watching it because of Gareth Bale. When he scored that header in the 96th minute, whatever it is, to take it at penalties and they won. That's, I've seen that many a times with top, top players. They never give up. He had to be in that right area at the right time. There's only going to be one player to score that goal. So no matter what happens in the game, whatever the score, 2 nil down, 3 nil down, you just keep going until that final whistle goes. And as long as you're giving it your best, no one can ask anymore. But then for me, this is the most special thing. Make it special. The time you get with your teammates and your friends and out on the field, on the soccer field, that's, that's the best times of your life. Because it does get to a point when you're too old and you can't do it no more. So make it special. Enjoy it. Play with a smile on your face. Um, and try things. Um, as long as you're doing the other things above it, like the aiming high, the working hard, as long as you're making it special and enjoying it, it's so important, OK? And then the last thing is acting with integrity. Uh, I mean, that's what I said earlier about helping coaches. If someone needs a hand, like you help them along, OK? Uh, whether it's opposition as well. You win a game rather than going off and celebrating in their face. Shake their hands, first of all. I mean, you can probably celebrate in their face, but make sure you're, um, do, you're, you, you're, you're professional and disciplined before that. Next page. And then again, the values, hard work and discipline, respectful. So then we just sort of covered that there. So if you see on the right, this is the staff I had at, um, under 18s at Brighton. You can see how many staff and what it involved. So it went from I had myself as manager, assistant manager, goalkeeper coach, player care officer, strength and conditioning coach, lead performance analyst, physiotherapist, psychologist, academy teacher, mental well-being and education manager. So that's how big it is. That's just the 18s. And then you go to 23s, that doubles in size. You go to the first and that doubles. So we're all in one building, all working together with the end goal of producing players to the first team. So you know, that's the amount of staff we have in. And what I'll show you now is the actual programme that we did. And this is the programme. Can you zoom in on that one on the, on the left or not? So this is a schedule I've designed. Um, this is this will be a day to day. So if you're a scholar coming in between leave school at 16 in England, and this is the this is like their college program. So there'll be 17, 18 year olds coming to do this. We're starting on Monday morning, they come in for breakfast, education in the morning, which is really important still. Uh, so one group will be doing education, one group will be doing analysis of the game for the Saturday in units. Um, and they'll have your own unit coaches as well. We then break up for lunch and then train at two o'clock. The training on a Tuesday would be individual sessions, which is massive. And I know you've got your own IDPs as well there. So I'm going to do another session on that. We're going to it in more depth. So there'll be four or five coaches scattered about. So if I'm a defensive coach, I'll be working with the defenders, working on what each individual needs within that session. Um, so they do that on a Monday. As soon as they finish, they then go off to do an upper body. Because they would have played on a Saturday, the upper body would be, the legs would still be tired. So we wouldn't touch the legs. It would be an upper body program. Everyone has their own individual one. Uh, um, and they'd be working for an hour in a gym. So you can see they come in at nine o'clock and they don't leave until probably five by the time they've had a shower. So that's day one. Day two would be a Tuesday. Breakfast again, education. Start training at 10.15. Now Tuesday would be our hard day. And what I mean by that is be big area stuff. So we can work on scenario games, team stuff, um, but it'd be over big areas. We could do a lot of football fitness um, with them, um, but it would be our big day. So player loads in England is between one and five. It would be a player load four stroke five. So it'd be a tough day. And then have lunch, education. And then in the afternoon, we'll present back to them individual analysis, which would be from the previous game on a Saturday. Um, sometimes I present as a coach, sometimes a players, it'll be player led, which is really beneficial as well, getting players to speak in front of each other. Um, then Wednesday will be breakfast at Dick's um, or the training ground, coming for education, training recovery session from the day before lunch. Um, and this will be an earlier day. They'll be home by probably two, three o'clock after education. Okay. Thursday, uh, breakfast, psychology. Now, I don't know if any of you work with psychologists, but we had a really good one. Um, a lot of them sometimes just play it by the book and are, are not very good. We had an excellent one at Brighton where she actually looked at body language. I'd have her on a picture of me. She would look at who was doing well, whose head was down, and she would notice little things that you probably wouldn't notice as a coach. But also what she did do is watch her opposition. We played Arsenal once. 
And we always analyse games before and we played them. And she always said that the left back and the left winger, every time they give the ball away, um, they started arguing amongst each other. Now there's friends from London. They've been friends from five years old and they always bickered. So every time one of them give the ball away, their first reaction wasn't to win it back. They're turning and going, what are you doing? We exploited that. We told the players, we showed them a video. Every time we won it, we were boom, ball in behind that left back. We won 6-2. Arsenal had never been beaten six ever. And we beat them 6-2. Four goals come from us winning it and playing it behind that left back. So as soon as that happened with that psychologist, I thought, that is unbelievable. And I made it a key ingredient, what we do. So if you see psychologists in sport and you think, nah, it's nothing to do with football, if you get the right one, it is a really beneficial for you as a player. And not just when you're in a bad frame of uh, mental frame, when you're in a good frame as well, things are going well. What, what, what is, what, why are you playing well? What keeps your mind um, like nice and confident and strong? Because uh, it's quite easy to go to them when you're not playing well and how you get back to that level. So they are really key. And if you haven't looked into it yet, it is quite a good, um, a good tool to have as a player as well. Um, and then we train also in the afternoon. And the reason we're training in the afternoon is give them an extra recovery from the Tuesday and the gym session the day before. We then do a longer session in the gym. Um, so they'll be working on legs. A um, lot of powerlifting. England's known for its intensity in the sprints and uh, a lot of powerlifting. Olympic lifting is called. But they're doing a lot of squats with like 100 kilo weight. So um, they do that on a Thursday. Friday would be very light. Match prep, looking at the opposition, attack, defence, set pieces, home after lunch at half 12. Um, and then games on a Saturday, obviously. And the only day off they'll probably have is either on a Sunday and occasionally on a Wednesday, depending on the load of the week. So as you can see, that's a full on week. That is, they've just left school. They've gone straight into a football programme. There's 20 of them. Um, Obviously, I can only play 11 players at one time. So you, as a coach, I've got to manage the nine that ain't playing. How do I keep them happy? The 11 that are playing. How do you keep improving them? How do we keep them in the team? So it's, it's uh, quite a hectic schedule. And I don't know if any of you have seen these schedules before. I'll ask at the end, but um, it is full on. And that's not just Brighton. That's every team in the country will be doing this at 17, 18. Can I have the next slide, please? Oh. So what that, all these are really is just what we just talked about. So what I do, if you come out of the presentation now, please. So what I'm going to do now is like you just seen a little bit about my playing career, a little bit about the schedule. So, so I don't keep going on. I just want to go to you now, ask you some questions on anything that we just seen then. OK, not not so much about my career, about the Brighton stuff. And then we go on to the career and coaching career after. Anyone? Just unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, okay. uh, could I ask a question? Could I ask a question? Yes. Uh, just you mentioned uh, earlier that you went and played at one point in Spain, if I'm not if I'm correct. Uh, how is it that, like, when you went to Spain, I think you came back to England, how did you deal with, like, the, the difference in lifestyle, maybe culture, etc.? Was it hard to adapt or relatively easy? Really good question. When I moved to Spain the first time um, and I was playing, I'm five foot ten, I'm about ten and a half stone, I'm a very aggressive player, so I've, what, I've lapped in size, I'm made up for aggression, so I used to fly into tackles. My first season at Millwall, I had 15 yellow cards, I was the most yellow carded man in the country, me and um, Roy King, anyone know Roy King? Me, him and Ian Wright, I was the top three in the country. So when you went to Spain, you literally fly for them tackles, bust, red card. So I had to learn to not dive in, I, and I had to learn to get there, stand up, the... Uh, Probably the biggest thing was the language barrier. I had to learn Spanish really quickly. At first, I had a Scottish guy who's there 25 years, and he helped me, and literally translated everything for me. But then he said, you've got to get on with it because you're not learning. So that was the biggest barrier for me. But literally, I've been there four months. I then got given a coaching role. So then I got thrown even more in the deep end. So I was a player, 29, 30, and I was a coach. So I had a head coach with me, but I was literally taking all the coaching. So I really... Football's, uh, you could show by demos, you could show by example and then let it, let the players get on with it. Um, the hardest thing was then 
speaking in fluent um, language to them, um, but I could do it in broken Spanish. Um, but then coming back, I become a much different player because in England, again, the hustle and bustle. But what I learned was to be more controlled. I got less yellow card to give away less free kicks. I was more disciplined in my play. Um, and like I say, I come back and that first year I was back, I um, played at the New Wembley and won the trophy. So I was really pleased I did come back. Thank you. I did miss the sunshine though, mate. Anyone else questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, how, um, how, as an amateur player, or like a non-academy player, how is he supposed to like catch up and like reach the same level as an academy player who trains twice a day and is li living the like dream life? How old are you? How old are you? I'm 17. Okay. Well, I, I, I do coach players here, um, one-to-ones, and um, that dream they still have. It's never too late. Like my son... He was yeah, 16 I know, and I know, five. I know it's not you know too about late. Sam. Yeah. Stay cool. Yeah. So, so what? It's not too late. So, my son was 16. He got released from Brighton. Couldn't find a club. So he went non-league, and which is amateur. Um, yeah. It took him four years. He had to go non-league and an amateur for four years to then get a professional contract. So he's 22 now. Um, okay. It took him four years. So it's that resilience, yeah. that never giving up. Um, keep playing for your teams um not being in too much of a rush either because sometimes i get players emailing me saying oh i, I, I should be at your club i want to do this i want to do that if you're at a club and you're doing well stay there because i always say if you're doing really well you will get found you will get found someone will always spot you someone will always see you you if you drive coaches mad by sending emails every two minutes it gets to the point in the end where they're like oh it's this guy again so the quality I feel will always come out. Um, and whether it's at 17, 18, 19, if you've really got that desire to want to be a footballer, then hope and you get that little bit of luck, um, it could come true for you. Okay, th thank you very much. That was It was very helpful. Uh, another question is that me personally, I have like, I was at a club. They didn't do very well and got like rele relegated. So I like like rushed re like a lot to find another club, but and I'm at another club now, which isn't academy. D do you like recommend me to to like stay at the club till I get like get scouted or to try like later on and find like a bigger club? It it depends what the club's like. The most important thing is that if you're getting good training and it's a good coach and it's good structure, then stay at that club. If it's not, and if you're not getting good coaching, it's more of a, a fun and it's people's, um, it's their release, then no, no, I would it's say it's try pretty to much move. Like it's, it's a, a decent, serious club. Well, I'll stay there. Huh? I would stay, I would, I would stay there. Stay there, work hard, okay. do the best okay. you can, get good training and build yourself up. Most important thing is, is, Work for your team, work as hard as you can, but work on the things you need to work on. And whether that's doing extras in training, asking the coaches to help you after, having an individual plan, which I know you've got there, which you could help improve yourself all around in all areas of your game. That's the best way. Okay. Thank you very, very much, coach. No worries, mate. Thank you. I got could I just ask one more question? Joshua? Go ahead, go. Okay, um, I was just going to ask, um, with the Brighton Academy schedule, then it's quite jam-packed. Um, do the players ever get fatigued or do they? is there a way for them to, I don't know, speed up their recovery or something? Um, yeah, but we have ice baths, we have hydrogen chambers. Um, they, they're on them days. So if I go for the load, how we work it, and this is the same as the first team, it's the same as England, what they do. You get your player load one to five. So Monday, when we break into the units, we would, as a team of coaches, we'd look, the 11 that played, they would do a one stroke two 
session, which is literally nothing, 30 minutes. So they warm up, do 30 minutes of the things they need to work on, and then they'll go in. The ones that didn't play on a Saturday will be a two-stroke three. So they do the stuff the other boys did. When they go in, we'd do a harder session. So, and when I first went there, they used to do running with them. And I thought, that's rubbish because anyone can do running and we're a professional football club. So I did position specific fitness. So if you're a winger, for example, you start on the halfway line, coach knock the ball 20 yards, they run, sprint, 30 yards of the ball, whip it in the box, then sprint back, recovery run. That was running. That was proper fitness running. Midfielder would get it on the edge of his box, ping it wide, sprint forward, have a header in the box, come out, sprint back to the halfway line. So I designed sessions that would make it match realistic for them players. So if you don't play on a Saturday for whatever reason, you feel you need fitness, don't go running around the block and do 20 minute run. Try and think of something that is explosive. Think of something that's relative to your position. Think of the movements you'll be doing as a player in the game and to help you. So that would be a Monday. Tuesday would be a four. That's a heavy day. Wednesday would be a zero. So that would be their recovery down day. Now, we get players, we catch them playing head tennis, things like that. It's OK. But if we'd had a lot of games and you're getting towards the end of the season and they're knackered, that's when we say, don't even come in. Go at home. Go cinema. Do something with your friends. Um, chill out. Thursday will be a free day, a free day, like load free. And Friday will be one stroke two again. So training is all planned around load. It's all to the second, to the minute. Um, and every single player is an individual programme. So they each know that we know who's fatigued, who needs taken out that day. Because what happens if you flunk your players and you've worked too hard and too much, you get injured. And once you get injured, you then get repetitive injury because you're always catching up. So it's about, I know I said hard work and going out running, but it's doing it in moderation and making sure you know, you, like you wouldn't go on a run on a Sunday if you just played on a Saturday. So knowing when you're doing it, have your own little individual programme with it as well, yeah? Thanks, Joshua. Uh, could I ask just when when you arrived at Brighton, uh, did you find it uh, difficult because, you know, like a big team such as Brighton maybe has a lot of players, a lot of different personalities, different play styles and players, etc. Was it hard to maybe get the group together the way you wanted it to? Or did you find it maybe simple to adapt to certain play styles? Yeah, the first two years, I wasn't the manager, I was the assistant manager. So I found that harder because... In my head, I had ideas and I wanted to do things, implement it. And so I had to sit tight, really. And the ideas I give, if the other manager didn't like it, then I, right, I'll shelve that till a later date. When I actually got in, I'm not being beginning, but when, when we got in, I, we broke all records. We come third in, fourth in my first, fifth in my first season, which is a record. They'd always finished 10th, 12th. Um, then we went 10 months unbeaten, which is unheard of. We were smashing everyone. 10 months. And then my next year, we won the Premier League Cup, um, which, again, we beat everyone. We beat Man United, we beat Palace, Chelsea, West Ham on the way. Um, and then we won the Cup um, in the end of it. And But that team had a special team. And, you know, you get them years as a group where they're just unbelievable. We win everything. Um, three of them in the first team now, Evan Ferguson. And write down his name. He's going to be unbelievable. He's 17 and he's in the first team now in and around it. Um, Hayden Roberts. We had a, Andy Moran plays for Ireland. Unbelievable players. But you know the really good thing about it? We had one from Denmark. We had a, two from Ireland. I had one from Australia. Now, the kid from Australia, this this is what I was talking about luck to you, boys. One of my, one someone I used to play with, he was on the holiday in Australia visiting family. He went and watched a game. He see this kid, um, Cameron. And he rung me when he came back. He said, mate, I've just seen a player. He's playing for Australia under 19s, 18s. He's unbelievable. We got him in on trial. He come and trained. And do you know what I loved about him? It was his attitude. He was brilliant. He come and talked. He looked like a surfer. Lovely, blonde hair, tied up, but played like a dream. He just never think about it. This is too good to be true. He trained two weeks, off in a contract. And now he's he just travelled with the first team to Dubai. So little stories like that. His luck was that my friend was on holiday in Australia watching the game. So you never want, you never know who's watching. If I say to you, right, you've got scout watching Saturday, you would try your hardest. You would do so much to like want to be the best. That's the worst thing you could do. You go and play your normal game. If you're not Ronaldo and don't do 20 step overs a game, don't do it because there's a scout there. You play your normal game and the scouts will see that more than uh, if you was trying to take everyone on and not be a team player. So play your normal game. Don't worry about who's there. Um, and as I say, if it happens, it happens for you. Okay. 
Great, thank you. Any other questions? Coaches? Good afternoon. I have a question actually. Yeah. Uh, my question is if what was what is what would be something that you would uh in your career something you would have changed like something you you think about it now that you would have uh improved on back then um you know you know it sounds really weird when i was at Millwall, when they had an offer for me for 150,000, i was a Millwall fan for and through my family's all from london and sheffield if you don't know it's like four hours away up north so i was 20 years old and I signed for Sheffield, not because it was a really great move. I signed for Sheffield because I dealt that Millwall set to the offer. I, I was upset. So I would have probably taken more time before I made that decision. Um, and yeah, I had to think about it. So I literally, I've got the phone call Wednesday morning. I went up to Sheffield Wednesday afternoon. But I went Wednesday night, I changed my whole life because I had signed a three-year contract up in Sheffield. Um, I just started going out with a new girlfriend um, and I thought, oh, that's going to be over. Luckily, she's still with me. Um, and that's the reason it's got Claire on my box, by the way. My name's not Claire. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I would have taken more time because Millwall was my club and I would have loved to stay there longer. But um, yeah, things happen for a reason. Uh, my, my twins were born there. So I, I do believe that if I probably wouldn't have moved to Sheffield, that wouldn't have happened. So yeah. Um, I don't regret nothing. I mean, you look back at the end of your career when you play football and there'd be one or two little things, but at the end of the day, um, it's the best It's the best life in the world, boys. You're waking up doing something you love every day. You kind of kick a football about with your friends and your pals and um, it, it's just unbelievable. But you just, like I said, Danny, you've got to make the most of it. Thank you. Mark, one uh, question I had is uh, from a, being a player in, in those divisions and now coaching, in, in, in that level, what would, what would you say is the biggest difference in terms of how we're forming players today? Oh, it's completely different. I mean, uh, the science, like when I was a youth team player, we had one youth team coach full-time, a physio. That was it, two staff. So that one coach would take the whole team. He was your, and he it, it was the best coach I've ever worked with because he was everything. He was your psych. He was your inspiration. He was your mentor. Um, but now, obviously, people have you've got your SNC coaches. So if, if you see in my presentation, there's I I'd have meetings every morning at nine o'clock, and I'd have ten staff there, um, and we'd all have a say in it. And um, the biggest thing is the SNC program and uh, the way the players are looked after now, especially in the Premier League. The Premier League is an absolute joke. You come here, if any of you get lucky enough to play Premier League or an MLS, is you, you've won the lottery. Um, but Coach, uh, the players as well, the players have changed. You have to teach them different. Back in the day, uh, my manager he, he used to punch us. He used to grab us by the neck. If I did that now, I'd be put in jail, so <laughs> in prison. So you've got to talk to players. I'm, I'm a very good, me, myself, I'm good at realising who needs what. Somebody could get a kick up the bum. Someone needs an arm around the shoulder um, and how each player works. The most important thing is getting to know your players and uh, knowing how they tick and knowing about their home life, knowing how that is and how their school life is and and getting to know them, no, not just talking about football because boys, listen, football's there for you probably all to be on end all, but like I say, I had boxing as well. So you need a release because if you just literally chuck everything in at football, it don't work. And then later down the line, I don't know, mentally it could really like um, hurt you. So have something else as well, whether that's sport or not non-sport. Um, let's have something else that you can have focus on as well for your bad days, okay? Any other questions? But listen, like I said, boys, earlier, I'll come back on. I'll arrange it with um, to talk about your IDPs and how we used to work on um, so it's your individual development plan. I've, I've done it with Dan Ashworth. Now, Dan Ashworth is one of the biggest um, like football directors in the country. He worked for England for 10 years. He literally transformed England and how good they are now. And um, so I've done it with him when he was at Brighton and this, um, we break it into position. So I'll go through it with you. So, and then I can maybe share with the coaches about 
I know you do your individual development plans at the minute, but really how we focus on it and just look at one thing each month, so one in possession, one out possession, one strength, one psych, what do I need to work on? And then um, keep reviewing every four weeks. And that four weeks, has my left foot improved? Has my crossing improved? Am I shooting? Do I need to work on shooting? What type of shooting? If you say shooting, what type? Is it side foot, laces, getting timing of run? So thinking outside the box in terms of your development, okay, and what you really actually need. So, but I'll come back on after Christmas and I'll have a really good chat with you and then maybe help you with some of your plans as well. Anything else? Any more questions? Here's your chance, guys, to ask any questions. Think about it. Um, I did want to ask one more, Mark, in terms of the, the World Cup. I know uh, McAllister's at Brighton, right? Or he, he is. What, did you have a chance to work with him at all? <laughs> you know what, boys? I wasn't going to say, actually. But McAllister's first day, the first team wasn't actually him. So have you heard of Ease Bazuma as well? Bazuma signed for Tottenham for 35 million in summer. And he played in the World Cup. I've got top got phone calls to say they're going to be training with you for the next two days. So I'm thinking they sign a lot of players, Brighton, and um, a lot of them come in and go alone. So these two come in and they said he was going back to Boca next week. He's just in for a week. So Boca Juniors. So I'm, okay. I come in, lovely guy, didn't speak any English, neither did Bazuma. So I spoke a little bit of Spanish. So first session, I was doing a passing drill and I was part of showing them what to do, did the demo, Bazuma was doing all sorts, kicking it, flicking it over his head. So I had to stop the session and said, mate, mate, come on, do like the rest of the boys. I oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And then we played a match at the end and oh my God, it was unbelievable. McAllister. But you'd never think three years ago that he would go on to be a World Cup winner and have the impact he had because he he just had a 20 hour flight. He got there, he had to train with the under 18s, which he wasn't happy about. He came in the next day, he was brilliant again. Um, but to see him go on three years later when I've coached him at 19, 20 to win in the World Cup, it's just amazing. And Bazuma as well. Bazuma went 35 million this summer and he done, he's done brilliant as well. Yeah, that's amazing. What do you what do you think about the transfer window in January after a World Cup? I mean, this is the first time in history we're going to see a transfer window right after the World Cup. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Is there going to be much more movement? No, the, the, the thing is with January is they're rubbish because the, the main players are tied down on contracts. You end up paying too much money for the players that they, they're not worth. Um, it, it's, it's more about the loan signings, players getting loaned. The, 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 you don't see good transfers until the end of the season. The, these January ones, whatever ones happen, are going to be rubbish. <laughs> I think the most important thing is going to be the injuries coming back from the World Cup. Like Arsenal have lost two, top of the league, but lost two key players. So um, it depends how they all come back. And then you look at Brighton, how are them players? You just got to think, normally, when they finish the World Cup, they've got a two-week holiday. Then they're going to have six-week pre-season. And they have eight weeks to get over it. They've literally got a come back. It's like coming from a war zone. You come back from a war zone and just go straight back into civilian life. And they've now got to do that, coming back from that high of winning a World Cup to go playing in cold, freezing night in London somewhere. So that, that's going to be interesting as well. See how all the players adapt to that. Definitely. Guys, any other questions? Um, please, you know, that's in, part of, you know, football formation and, and, and you know, getting your goals and going towards your goals is, is being out, getting outside your comfort box. And, and I was, you know, obviously in being calls with this and with such people as Mark asking the questions that you want to ask is, is do it. You know, there's, if you have any questions, last questions, please ask uh, a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, wisdom here um, that you can get. Um, but Mark, I, I did want to ask uh, uh, one more question on the coaching side with Brighton. Um, do you, when you get into these colder winter months, do the trainings change a bit in terms of uh, the conditions? We're lucky we got a 3G and we got a dome. <laughs> so the dome is um, very busy at that time, yeah. So, uh, but also on the Premier League, and they got two under soil heated pitches, so uh, which cost a million pounds. So if they, you could go there, could have eight inches of snow, you go to the pitch and there's nothing on it, it's crazy. So, um, yeah, it's. Um, clubs like that but teams lower down they have to hire Astros like League 1 League 2 they have to, you have to think outside the box and just try, do the best you can do so, like Barnet my son's team they've been to boxing clubs last week they went to a spin bike class it's just to keep that fitness up with doing something you know 
And we had a uh, in the chat, Abdullah had a question, Mark, about um, about confidence and self confidence and how a player can work on it. Um, it's hard. When I was younger, I didn't really know myself, um, and it would be, I'll get told. A coach told me once, if you haven't got much confidence, then just keep everything simple. So, the next couple of things you do on the pitch or in training, just keep it simple. Just do it one touch, two touch. Don't complicate it, and that will then get you back into your rhythm. As I got older and I was a player, I then it's good to watch him back old videos yourself. I know like there's Instagram and there's all video things now. If you're having a bad time, just remember what you did well before and maybe get up old videos of you doing a dribble or scoring a goal or doing a trick um, or even your favourite player just to get inspiration for them. Just watch clips of Messi for half hour. But um, yeah, it's confidence is a big thing. And as you get older, you learn to live it a lot better and you not worry by mistakes. But when you're your age, it's very tough and it's hard to get out of it. Again, it's a mindset thing. It's re reprogramming your brain to, right, I've made a mistake. Right, I'm going to get it back. Oh, God, I'm giving it away again. Let's get it again. Don't stop wanting the ball because when you start hiding, that's when it gets worse. And then it becomes mentally even more challenging because you're not getting the ball because you're not making the right angle. So don't let anything affect you. Just um, if, if, as long as you're always trying to get it and trying the right things, then... Just keep going. Excellent. And unless you have your hand up, did you want yes, to Yes, hello. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have a question. I don't know if it's too specific, but for example, in my squad, I just uh, like got accepted uh, from a trial. And I, obviously, I don't have like the best position in the squad. Would you recommend me to work on my weaknesses or like my strong attributes? Like um, now or in general? Yeah, work on both. I mean, you because if you start working on one thing and then not carrying work on your strengths, what will end up happening is they go like that. So it's keeping that balance right. Carry on working with your weaknesses, but also work on your strengths. Um, and again, getting that balance right. Like it might mean 10 minutes working on your left foot and then five minutes working on your strike and your right. Um, so the balance is you're still doing more work with your left, but you're still doing that bit to the right. Um, Okay. So I'm not having too many targets, not having too many, because then what happens is you'll end up getting none of them better because you're working on too many things. So getting that balance right, really focus on them. And if you're not in the right position, I'm not in the right place at the minute, just have a word with your coach and just say, oh, listen, I'll, I'll play anywhere for you, but um, this is my favourite position and I like a chance there one time. Because uh, firstly, thank you. And secondly, I, I just feel like if you work on your like strength and you get like really good at like something, let's say dribbling, or you uh, get really really fast, I feel like you just stand out in front of the coach more. Yeah, yeah, it, it depends, mate. And um, yeah, you got to keep working on it. But as I say, you got to get that balance right. The most important thing is getting your balance right. If you're a strong dribbler, then continue working on it. You probably you're not going to lose that really. Um, and, but what you may have to do is learn different tricks because people, as you get older and you get um, more analysis and teams watch you, if you do two step over every time you get it and go to your left or you go inside all the time, we as coaches say he's going to go inside all the time to show him out and he won't know what to do. So get and that be unpredictable. That unpredictability is, is a big, big thing. All right. Thank you very much. No worries, mate. Thank you. Just a quick Did comment Charlie on my question. question. Charlie put a text up, but I couldn't see what it said. Okay, uh, the check. Yeah, Al, do you want to read it out? Yes, yeah, so Charlie, who is the manager that has taught you the most and helped you develop as a coach? And are there any mental challenges of being a coach? No, it's plenty of mental challenges, yeah. Um, uh, for me, like when I was at Brighton, people in and around the club, they felt the pressure of developing players. I never felt that. I just wanted to work every day with them because if you provide a good environment where there's no pressure on the players, the players will perform better. So I always tried to um, keep the environment and the place a happy place. Even if I was angry and I was... They know if I'm angry and they know like when um, I was in a good mood or bad mood, but if you're keeping it happy and even if you lost, I'll never speak to the players after a game, ever. So if we just won 5-0, I'll go and say, well done, boys, and we'll talk about Monday because I've been in many a change rooms where I've been in and 
lost the plot saying, oh, you've done this, you can see the goal, watch the goals back. And um, it was nothing to do with him. And then you could never take that moment back. So I always um, uh, let that moment go, give it 24 hours, watch the game back and then come back and talk one day with the players. And then it's a more constructive chat. In terms of players I played with, I played with one of the best managers, you won't know him, he's dead now, bless him, uh, Howard Kendall. And in the 80s and 90s, he's one of the best managers ever. Um, I had him at Sheffield United and he was just an unbelievable man manager. Um, he was unreal. I had Mick McCarthy at Millwall, who was Ireland manager for 10, 15 years. Um, and then at Brighton, I mean, I learned a lot from Dan Ashworth. Um, I'm obviously with Graham Potter, who's Chelsea manager now. I still speak to him all the time. Um, him and his staff are excellent, very approachable and learned a lot from them. So uh, Graham Potter learned from, a lot from him as well. Excellent. Thomas, did you have a question? I was just going to add one more um, uh, point to the to the previous question on uh, mentality. And obviously, I know that um, especially like, uh, I mean, at, at any age, really, but, um, you know, the mental strength and confidence and how to deal with setbacks is obviously um, a very important part um, if you're trying to make it um, in football. And so uh, one part I was just going to add here in the Train Effective app, if you go on the Learn tab, um, just for anyone who doesn't know, if you go here on Courses, obviously, and then click on strengthen your mentality. Um, you'll actually find plenty of courses um, uh, talking about um, topics related to mentality and mindsets. And so one of the things I can recommend is the course with Rio Ferdinand, um, as well as the one um, with Akin Fenwa, um, because th this one is actually an interesting example because Akin Fenwa, um, I think we had this actually in the last month's masterclass that touched on this as well, but he, he was always told that he was too big. He was never going to become a footballer. Uh, and, you know, he doesn't have the right body for it. And he had a great career in football, uh, play in the championship, etc. So there's plenty of like uh, stuff in the app that you can check out as well. That's brilliant. I have to let myself, mate. Might learn something. Always. Never stop learning. Never. Excellent, guys. Any, any last questions for Mark? Uh, here's your chance, my friends. But, well, listen, thanks for your time anyway. That, that was really good. And um, like I say, I'll be back on again. The most important thing for all of you is that um, you enjoy it. You enjoy football, enjoy it. Um, you've got so much to look forward to. Uh, when things don't go well for you, just don't worry about it. Just keep going. Okay? You'll have uh, plenty of ups and downs in football. It's a, it's a crazy roller coaster ride, and, um, but there's no better game to be in. Okay, so keep working hard. Have a great Christmas. And... Um, yeah, and I'll see you all soon, yeah? Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, a lot Thank of us here. Thank you Cheers, very much. Boys. See you later. Thank you. Cheers, Thomas. Thanks, Al. See you, boys. Happy Christmas. <laughs>